Israel has Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and Greer has Steve, the weeping pastor. <laughs> I think part of it is I just have such a burden for our community and for people who just don't know Jesus. Thank you, Jeremy, for reminding us that sometimes the blessings that we get don't always come in the way we tell God we want them. Anybody ever heard of Sir Isaac Newton? Mm -hmm. The old Sir Isaac Newton, the guy sat under the apple tree, apple fell on his head, and he said, oh, there must be gravity. That Isaac Newton. He didn't only develop the theory of gravity, he did all kinds of theories with mathematics and physics. But the wonderful thing about Sir Isaac Newton was he had a dog. And he loved that dog. And that dog went with him everywhere. And one night, Sir Isaac Newton was working in his office, or another room, and had been working for months and months and months on the theories of the nature of the universe. And so laid out on this table before him, he had papers and stacks and pens and ink and all these things with all these theories and formulas and all of his work and a candle. And at one point he got up to leave the room and the dog, who never left his side, immediately jumped up to follow him. And when he jumped up, he bumped the table, and the candle fell over and caught all the papers on that desk on fire. Destroyed months and months and months of work. All the things that he had been preparing for were gone in an instant of a fire. And when he came back to the room, he immediately put the fire out, of course. And then he just sat on the floor and he cried. And he cried and he cried. And the dog came up to him and licked him on the face. And Sir Isaac Newton put his arms around the dog and said, You will never know what you have done, but I love you. The history of humanity there's the same thing. Starting from the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis, we see Eve takes the fruit of the forbidden tree. God gives them a garden. Her and Adam has given them the garden with everything they could possibly want or need. Everything to meet every need that they could possibly have has put them in a place of absolute utopia and perfection. But he says, there is one tree in the center of the, this garden that you are not to eat the fruit of. It's the, the tree of knowledge. And so Adam and Eve go about their business, and one day Satan comes up and he says, he didn't really mean that, and so she takes a bite of the apple, or whatever the fruit was from that tree. And Adam follows suit. And they realize, first of all, that they're naked, so they throw fig leaves together, cover themselves, and then they hear God coming in the distance, walking to meet them for their afternoon. He was on his afternoon or evening stroll through the garden to have fellowship with Adam and Eve, and he's looking for them, and sure enough, he comes upon them and they're covered. And he confronts them about what they've done. And in God's apparent sadness, he must have thought, you have no idea what you've just done. And we can continue on through scripture because passage after passage shows us people just like you and me. Everyday people get up, go to work, go home. Try to make a living. Try to put the food on the table. Try to just get from one day to the next. 
It's all about people who live out their lives hurting God's great plan for humanity. And we read over and over again the many times that people cause God to just shake his head and say, you just have no idea what you've done. The lesson in our gospel from Mark this morning is just another example of people being human, just not getting God's plan. So if you'd like to follow along with me, we're going to be reading from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark in verses 35 through 45, and I invite you to hear the Word of God this morning. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Sound familiar? Anybody pray that? We want you to do for us whatever we ask. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do? And they replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other sit on your left in glory. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Oh, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the other ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the reading of our gospel lesson for today, and this is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. The audience that Mark was writing to still had not come to grips and come to terms with the fact that the cross is necessary and a huge and major component and an integral part of being a disciple. They still had not connected the cross with discipleship. They still thought, Jesus will be back any day now, and it's all going to be good. I think a lot of us today still have a grasp the concept that the cross is a part of discipleship. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We cannot take the two apart. No matter how many times and how many ways Jesus explains that to follow him means to take and follow the way of the cross, we just don't get it. Why? Because it's a hard lesson to learn. I don't know about you, but I struggled with math from the first grade through college. I took the very least amount of math that I ever had to do. I was okay with 1 and 1 equals 2, but when you wanted to go to A plus B equals 12, it blew me away. A plus B, don't put the alphabet in math, and don't put numbers in English literature. Just do arithmetic. I made it through enough, just enough math to get a degree. Physics, no way. It's a hard lesson to learn. The fact that in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we can never ignore the cross, is a hard lesson to learn. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, we constantly look out for ourselves first, and anybody else after that. So sometimes, and somehow, we feel like we're just hardwired 
to look for ways to satisfy our own needs and take care of ourselves, seek our own pleasures, first and foremost. And if, if, if there's anything left over, oh yeah, let's, let me be generous and hand it out. That's not the way of Jesus Christ. It's others first, and then ourselves. And we just can't get a hold of that sometimes. We can't wrap our human minds around that. In Mark's passage this morning, the example was James and John. And they find themselves face to face with Jesus Christ, but they're still missing the whole message of servanthood. They want that position of power and privilege. Let me sit on the right and you on the left. Now, the other Gospels say their mother was the one that put them up to it. And we mama's boys know how powerful that is. So before you get too hard on James and John, think about your own lives. And think about if you were face to face with Jesus, what would you ask him? And mama's sitting there tapping your shoulder so get what you can from him. <laughs> I know for five years into our our relationship. His, Tim's parents thought I was going to take him for everything he was worth. I was going to take the house and the truck and run off. And here we are 16 years later and married and all that stuff. But, you know, we mama's boys know the power of our mother's influence. That James and John were trying to secure that place of power and privilege with Jesus. And God through Christ just stands there with him and shakes his head and he sadly says, you just don't have any idea what you're doing. You don't know what you're asking. I have to admit that outside of my personal prayer time or confession before communion, I rarely consider my own sinfulness or the way I treat other people. I try to live a very good life. I really do. And with the help of God, I think I'm a pretty good person. But you know, when it comes right down to examining our own sinful hearts, and we're all sinful, ain't nobody walked in this door this morning. As a matter of fact, on our Wednesday night study, there's a, there was a plaque on the wall that said, No perfect people allowed. And yeah, that's true in this church, too. And I told Chance when he showed me that, picture that they bought. I said, that's probably the as close as we're going to get to that particular plaque. I said, but there ain't no perfect people allowed in here, because if you're perfect, you're screwing it up for all the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't need to be here, so you can just leave if you're perfect. <coughs> anyway. <Amen. laughs> Come on, Pastor. You know, before, you know, I, I think about my sinfulness when I'm in my prayer time. And I think about it when I get a confession before communion. But other than that, I just try to live a good life. I don't really think about how I influence and affect other people. Now, maybe some other people don't share my weaknesses. But I will admit that there are times that I've not only just failed not to do good, I've done some bad things in my life. And I am sorry for it. I have done some bad things, and I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't offer any excuses. Because that's just what humans do. We do bad things. I can't blame my mama. I can't blame my daddy. I can't blame my spouse, as hard as I try. <laughs> I can't blame my environment. I can't blame Flip Wilson, who taught me to say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> I can't blame anybody but me. I make all my own choices. I decide if I'm going to do something that's right or wrong. Most of the time when things happen, I'm sure I have no idea how much I have disappointed God. And there have been so many times, God must have a headache shaking his head over my life. Boy, you just don't know what you're doing. But Adam and Eve, James and John, and millions of others through the ages are like me. They have a deep, deep need for that voice outside of myself, neither condemning nor condoning me, but loving me just as I am. 
And that voice that says, my mercies are fresh for you each and every day. And that's the voice of God speaking to me through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I hope that I will never, ever take for granted that Jesus Himself offered up loud cries and tears to the One who forgives me and who ultimately became obedient to the cross and submitted His life and gave up His own life to become my eternal salvation. Thank you, Jesus. My mom was one of those people who never threw anything away. I think it's because she was a child of the Depression. But I remember, and she learned from my grandparents, you go to my grandparents' house, my grandmother would use a piece of tin foil until it couldn't be used again. <laughs> There'd be little pieces of tin foil laying up on the kitchen counter until it just couldn't be used again. She would rinse out paper towels and hang them over the sink to dry and use them again. My grandmother could make a box of Kleenex last six months. With a cold. She rinsed out baggies and used them again. So that's where my mom learned all this growing up in the Depression through her grandparents, but she never threw anything away. I mean, she took out the garbage once a week. It's crazy. I think it's just because we live in such a throwaway society that we just don't, don't pay attention to it. But when she went into assisted living, and we knew we had to sell the house that we all grew up in, we went to clean it out. And Lord, we went up in the attic. It took us a whole day to just clear the attic out. But in the attic and in my mother's desk, we discovered, in addition to all the household things that have been collected over the years, every single birthday card, anniversary card, every piece of macaroni art I made for her when I was a kid in Sunday school. Every ugly piece of pottery that I had ever created. And my brother and sister the same. She had saved everything of ours as a catalog of our lives and what we meant. And if she needed any memory of her children, she knew exactly where to go and where to find each and every <clears throat> Until she began to lose her memory, she could tell you where to find anything in that house. <coughs> Sometimes I think God's a little bit like my mom. If he's not Southern, maybe he's just a little bit eccentric. I believe that God <coughs> shares my mom's passion for saving everything. And I think he has an awareness of where everything is that he has saved. God doesn't do the normal, the expected thing of tossing stuff into the garbage that others say is useless and trivial. Instead, where others see worthlessness, God sees worth. Where everybody else sees something to throw away, God sees it as something to hang on to. Something worth taking a risk for. Something worth making a great effort to save. Something worth dying for. And God knows where everything is saved. And He can put His finger on it in a minute. God cares about everything that has been said. We're all pieces of macaroni art in God's world. God has saved us, and He knows where we are, and He knows what we mean. We mean. I believe that it is fully God's will that everyone has the salvation. Because he created us in his image. 
He has called us his own, and he holds us in the palm of his hand. The gospel is that because of our great need and God's great love for us, he sent Jesus Christ into this world. And he sent him to us to meet the need that we have. And that is to be in fellowship with him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. Amen. And through Jesus Christ, we are important. We are worth saving. We may be tucked away in a drawer in God's desk somewhere, but we are valuable to God. Amen. Hundreds of years before Jesus Christ ever even came to this earth, the prophet Isaiah wrote that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment brought us peace. It didn't bring peace to God. It didn't bring peace to Jesus. It didn't bring peace to the Holy Spirit. It brought us peace. And by His wounds, we have been healed. We have received healing. We have received new life through Jesus Christ. So the question of whether or not God loves us or cares for us, that was answered at the cross. Don't let anybody, and I mean anybody, tell you any different. God cares for us and He loves us. And that was proved on the cross of Calvary. And He didn't say, You have to be this way before I can come love you. He said, I love you just the way you are. Amen. Thinking back to last weekend for those who were on retreat, I have to ask, do you believe that? Do you believe that God, before the beginning of time, set a plan in motion for all of our lives? Do you believe that you are a part of God's plan? <coughs> Do you believe that your faith in Jesus Christ requires action? And here's the hard part. Are we being obedient to the call? Because we have to ask ourselves, is the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on this cross worth it? for our sacrifices that we're called to make? Are we going to be obedient to the call that Christ has put on all of our lives? Not to sit here on Sunday mornings and worship and praise, but to go out into our world and do something for Him. Are we going to take up our cross daily and follow Him? Who's been to Nashville before? Ever been to the Ryman Auditorium? Well, Ryman Auditorium used to be a home of the Grand Ole Opry. They got their own big fancy place now, but they used to perform in the Grand, Grand Ole Opry used to perform in the Ryman Auditorium. But the Ryman Auditorium was actually built as a church. It was built for the evangelist Sam Jones. He was a very famous guy back in the uh, early part of the 19th, uh, 20th century. And he used to have what he called his we call them revivals, but he called them quitting meetings. And Sam Jones would have these big quitting meetings where people would come to the Ryman Auditorium and they'd come confess their sins and confess what they were going to quit. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit cussing. I'm going to quit running around. They were quitting meetings. <laughs> One night... <laughs> at the height of the, just the emotional height 
of one of his Quentin meetings. He saw a very righteous woman sitting down on the front row and he said, Sister Sarah, what are you going to quit doing? And she says, I ain't been doing nothing all my life. I ain't been doing nothing and I'm going to quit that too. God's calling our lives is to quit doing nothing. It's to quit doing nothing in response to the gospel. God is telling us, I love y'all to come in here and sing and worship and praise. Does it don't make any difference on Monday morning? What's it worth? It doesn't make any difference Wednesday afternoon. What's it worth? If you forget what the songs are all about by lunchtime Thursday, what good is it? What are you going to quit doing? Are you going to quit doing nothing for my name's sake? We're called to care about others. We're called to care about their pain and their hurts and their needs. And we're called to care about their salvation. Just as Jesus cares about us and loves us enough to do that for us, we in turn must do for others and meet their needs. If we live our lives in obedience to God's call, that means we must deny ourselves and take up that cross and follow Him. We follow Him into a world with hope in our hearts, with acts of love in our hands, and words of grace and mercy and forgiveness on our lips. It's not about us, folks. It's about Him. It's not about us. It's about Him. And that is a promise that we've been given and that we're called to share. And we do it in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.